Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's webinar from the Energy Institute. My name is Rick Greenoff, and I'm the chair of the East Midlands branch of the Energy Institute. And tonight, we're very privileged to have as a speaker the director of Infinitas Design, Laura Bishop. Laura is also the chair of the Ground Source Heat Pump Association, and she's going to talk to us about heat pumps. Heat pumps is obviously a very topical subject at the moment, and I think we're in for a very interesting talk from Laura. Uh, we're recording tonight's session, and if you have questions during the talk, please enter them into the Q&A window at the right hand side. Uh, Laura will be happy to answer the questions at the end of her presentation. Um, also, just a plug for the Energy Institute in general, when you booked into the session, you will have been taken to the Energy Institute webpage, uh, and that's the same place that you'll have to go if you're thinking about becoming a member and you're not already. If you're not already, why aren't you? OK, I'm going to hand over to Laura now, who's going to start the presentation. Thank you very much. OK, hi, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me OK. And I hope you can also um, see my screen. Uh, Rick, I can see you. If you could put your thumb up to say you can see it, that would be great. Thank you very much. Brilliant. OK, so uh, good evening, everybody. I just want to say thanks to the Energy Institute for inviting me to speak uh, this evening. And heat pumps are one of my passions, so hopefully uh, that will come across and I'll be really pleased to answer any questions you've got at the end of the session. Um, so uh, the, the topic of um, heat pumps is very large and there's all sorts of things I could have talked about. So tonight I'm going to try and um, talk about where we are right now in, in the industry and how I see things going forward and why we at the Graswell Heat Pump Association and me personally think that this potentially could be the year of the heat pump. Uh, just a little bit of background about me. Uh, I'm a chartered mechanical design engineer. I've been working as an engineer for nearly well, just over 20 years. Um, I used to <coughs> I've worked for quite a few different companies, but my last job was with E.ON, where I worked in their commercial heat business. Uh, but for the last seven years, I've been running my own um, uh, sort of specialist consultancy in Derby, um, specialising in renewable heating. So that has been quite a lot of biomass in the past, but now is mainly focused on heat pumps of all types, mainly ground source, but I also look at air source, water source, um, with or without heating and cooling networks. Um, as Rick said, I'm also the chair of the Ground Source Heat Pump Association, which I took over from uh, my colleague Bean Beanland back in October last year. Uh, we exist to lobby for the ground source heating industry in the UK and we get involved in standards and training as well for that and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And as I said before, I'm a complete heat pump advocate. So anytime I get the opportunity, I will talk to people about, um, about heat pumps and how brilliant they are and how they can work in their homes, their businesses, any, any place that you need heating and hot water. But again, more on that in a little bit. So today I've been asked specifically actually to talk about um, the fact that heating uh, homes and businesses um, is a, a very big producer of carbon emissions. I think it's actually about 42% of our carbon emissions in the UK comes from heating and hot water. So bigger than electricity generation and transport. So heat pumps are a path to decarbonisation of heat. And we are really starting to see things change in terms of uh, people knowing, understanding about heat pumps. But just to put a bit of background, um, just for anybody who's on here and is a newbie to heat pumps, which is fine, uh, just a bit about what is a heat pump. Um, if you have a fridge freezer in your house, you will know what a heat pump is because that's what a fridge is. It's just working a bit harder and it's working in reverse. Um, on the left hand side of this little diagram here, you've got a heat source, which could be air, ground, water, wastewater, waste, heat. Um, and then on the right hand side, you've got your heating or cooling system and it uses the vapour compression cycle to operate, um, which means you've got a refrigerant inside your heat pump, which is basically going from a liquid to a gas and back again and releasing and absorbing energy. So that's how it works. And you are taking 
free low grade energy on the left hand side and you are converting it into high grade useful heat which you can use for your space heating, your radiators, your hot water for showering, for cooling uh, in office blocks and potentially in houses as well if as the um, atmosphere starts to warm up we're starting to see a bit more interest in cooling houses as well. So in a nutshell that is how a heat pump works. Uh, designing, I, I actually work a lot on commercial industrial um, heat pumps rather than domestic heat pumps, but um, the range of heat pumps is ginormous. On the left hand side here we have um, an 80 kilowatt system, two 40 kilowatt heat pumps here, they're about the size of a fridge freezer, producing heating and hot water for two houses, that's on the left hand side. And on the right hand side we have a very industrial looking system there, it's 800 kilowatts of heat pump there, a carrier system, um, that's producing heating and hot water for a big school or college campus in Scotland with a heat network and I'll talk a little bit about heat networks uh, in a bit as well. So, and actually you can go even bigger than 800 kilowatts, you can go up to multi megawatts, um, but there is a huge range of sizes of, of heat pumps and all different shapes and sizes. The key thing about heat pumps are, is that they are very flexible. We've already talked about the size. Uh, we can go from tiny little three kilowatts heat pumps that people might have in their apartment block in their own um, yeah in their own flats, up to 10 megawatts plus, which might be doing a city-wide scheme. It might be doing um, you know big, huge hospital campuses, things like that. So flexible in terms of size. What I love about heat pumps is that they are resource agnostic to an extent so wherever you're situated you can probably find a heat pump to suit you so you can have an air source heat pump which is obviously just taking energy from the air you can have a ground source which is typical ones that people talk about where you may have a borehole system or you might have horizontal pipes in the ground that's taking energy from the ground and that's your low grade and converting that into your high grade um, heating for your houses and offices and other buildings. There's water source and that can be all sorts of different water sources. That might be a lake, a river, a canal, the sea in some instances. Um, it could be wastewater from sewage. So the, the, um, the 800 kilowatt system I showed you there was actually a, a sewage heat recovery system. So we're taking the energy out of wastewater. It could be mine water. There's a lot of interest in mine water now. Uh, a couple of um, example schemes that are getting off the ground. Again, that's another big topic to be investigated, um, hugely un untapped in my opinion. And you could also be using waste heat from data centres. So there's all kinds of different resources for, for heat pumps. And you can get high and low temperature heat pumps. I'm going to talk about myths later on. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, you know, heat pumps can only do sort of 40, 45 degrees C. That's no good in my leisure centre or my massively old house. But actually, you can buy heat pumps that will do anything from 30 degrees C up to 90 degrees C, depending on the refrigerant you use. Um, obviously, the lower the temperature, the higher efficiency you get out of a heat pump um, because you have a compressor inside the heat pump that's taking electricity and you want to try and minimise the electricity that the heat pump is absorbing and make more use of the free um, low grade heat. But you can definitely produce temperatures up to 90 degrees C. And one of the main things I'm working with at the moment is propane heat pumps. I'm not going to go into too much detail there again you know massive topics so um but propane heat pumps um good efficiencies and we're we're seeing 70 75 degrees c out of those heat pumps no problem at all and of course because a heat pump is effectively a chiller working in reverse the heat pump will do heating and cooling and it can do them simultaneously so no gas boiler electric chiller systems you can have one heat pump that will do both uh both heating and cooling and hot water uh, which can save on footprints and save on cash for people who need both um, both types of energy. Uh, they are good for both new build and retrofit so if you've got new build homes definitely put a heat pump in if you've got a retrofit office block or um, a, a, a college building or a house you can definitely still implement a heat pump there need to take account of holistic design, looking at the whole building, not just replacing a gas boiler with a heat pump, which I'm seeing quite a bit of, uh, but they can definitely work very, very well in retrofit situations. 
and they're good across the board for all kinds of different um, um, buildings, uh, not just houses. And a little bit, tiny, tiny little bit on heat networks. Uh, that is a whole topic uh, of, of its own, heat networks. Um, we're now talking about fourth and fifth generation heat networks, fourth generation being um, low temperatures in the region of 40 to 60 degrees C. So heat, perfect for heat pumps and fifth generation, which are all also called ambient loops or shared ground loops in some situations. Uh, they are very, very low temperature. You might even be circulating um, water from a borehole system around a heat network and then each particular building has its own heat pump, which takes water from that uh, very cold network and does its own thing in individual buildings. And I have got a slide just to describe that in a second. So this is, um, I've only got two examples of, of heat networks with heat pumps, but it just gives a flavour of how flexible heat pumps can be. This is a, a, an estate village down in Oxfordshire. Um, there's 26 houses uh, in the estate which are owned by the landowner. They're very, very poor EPCs, all either running on electric heating, argus or oil fired boilers. They can't be re-rented because the EPC rating is so poor. So we actually designed a heat pump heat network system for them. This is a very small slide, but up you can just see um, I'll put the work. But there's a red box towards the top middle, and that's an energy center with 260 kilowatts of ground source heat pump in there, just uh, I think it's doing 60 degrees C into a heat network, which is the red lines on the map, which is going around to all of the houses which are coloured black. That's the 26 estate houses, and they will be taken off oil and off direct electric, and they'll be put onto this uh, heat pump led heat network. So they'll all be using low carbon um, heating, benefiting from clean air. That's a big thing uh, about heat pumps. And again, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and what's interesting is here that some of the private houses which are in this village also have expressed interest in coming onto the network and themselves just coming off oil because a lot of this is an off gas village um, so it's really interesting we've, we've actually sized up the heat pumps inside the energy center to, to allow for expansion of the scheme later on and as i said the, ten the tenants are benefiting from clean heat clean air and the the heat is being sold to them by the landowner in a heat price that's pre-agreed with them. This slide just talks about fifth generation, which is the ambient loop. Uh, and this is, so the, the blue circle in the middle is a heat network, it's meant to represent a heat network, and it might be operating anywhere between five and 20 degrees C. And you can see all the different types of buildings that can take heating and cooling off the network and also all the different sources of heat that can be injected into the network. So at the bottom there, you've got mines, mine water, you've got data centers on the left, you've got boreholes and rivers. And then on the sort of the top and to the right, you've got the different kinds of buildings that could be taking um, heating. So you've got houses that can be, each have a heat pump um, taking um, its primary energy, or its, its, its natural energy out of this network and producing heating and hot water for houses an office block that's taking heating and rejecting heat into the network to um, generate its cooling. And it's, again, this is so flexible. This is a flexible um, arrangement uh, suitable for all kinds of different buildings and heat pumps are perfect for that kind of thing. Okay, so 2021, why do we think this is the year of the heat pump? Heat pumps have been around for years and years and People have been installing them for a very long time. So what's different about this year? So first of all, it's partly to do with UK government policy. And I'm going to talk about the policy um, because it's a hindrance and it's also a booster at the same time. So we're in a little bit of a funny situation at the moment. Uh, but at the end of last year, things did change quite a bit with the, um, the, the things that the, the government were talking about in terms of decarbonisation and electrification of heat suddenly people are waking up to heat being a big issue that needs to be addressed. And very much the conversation changed at the end of last year. So previously I was talking to people and they were saying, well, what is a heat pump? They're now saying, how do I get a heat pump? How do I make this work in my building? So it's a very different conversation than I've seen over the last 10 years. And there's people who've been working in this industry a lot longer than me, and they're all saying the same kind of thing. This is a different kind of 
feel it's a different conversation. There is now a greater awareness of climate change and carbon reduction. Most days in the papers and on the news, you will see some kind of article about uh, climate change and carbon reduction. Um, Greta Thunberg, obviously, like her or hater, she has raised a lot of awareness. David Attenborough, there's other people who are talking about this a lot. Also, a greater awareness of air quality. Uh, whenever you burn something, whether even if it's clean gas, you do get particulates and other toxins being released into the atmosphere. And with COVID last year and still going on this year, um, even people who I know who are climate change den deniers were saying, do you not notice how clean the air is and how, how clear the sky is? And people saying it's probably because we haven't got road cars on the roads, people are staying at home. Uh, we, were, we were over the summer, people were burning less gas because it was summertime and we didn't have our boilers on. And people were very aware of the difference in air quality because of um, people being at home and not burning things, which then creates a, you know, a smog and a you know, nasty stuff in the air. And I think there is genuinely now people wanting to do their bit. And if they can afford it, they're wanting to do their bit and we're seeing that more and more and I don't want it to be, I personally, but lots of other people in the industry do not want it to be about people who can afford it uh, wanting to do that um, and having a heat pump. It's got to be a whole available for everybody and anybody. And what's really interesting from a technical point of view is there are some really innovative ways of operating heat pumps that are coming about um, and I will talk about that at the end uh, because with the with the uh, heat incentive and other grants being removed, looking at different ways of operating and running heat pumps and getting the bills down is a really important and interesting area of operation that we're looking at. So that's the positives. So I just wanted to do a couple of bits on what's holding us back. Why are we not just getting on with it? And uh, you know, and how, and how can we move forward from those bits from where we are now? So there's four areas, I believe, that are really uh, key areas that need to be addressed and we are addressing that's holding us back. So we've got the policy landscape in the UK. We've got a problem with um, a lack of skilled designers, installers and maintenance people. We really do have a problem with myths and bad installs of heat pumps in the UK. And we also have the ever present issue of the price of gas and electricity. The landscape in the UK is very much a jigsaw and there are some quite hefty bits missing from, from policy. So in 2018, uh, we had the clean growth strategy. And in fact, I'm going to whiz through this quite quickly. But a couple of weeks ago, I did do a a separate webinar on policy uh, around heat pumps and uh, half an hour if you if you really want to know more you'll find it on the GSHPA YouTube channel um, talking about all these policies in depth when they're happening what it means for everybody. At the end of 2020 Boris uh, released his 10 point plan for green industrial revolution that was where the 600,000 heat pumps per year by 2028 came from that that month we also had the committee on climate change sixth carbon budget which informs a lot of government decisions and we also had the energy white paper released which talked about heat pumps as well in terms of grants and incentives the renewable heat incentive there's a domestic one and a non-domestic one uh, that's been around since 2011 the domestic scheme has been extended to March next year, 2022, but the commercial scheme ends this month, actually at the end of this month, unless you have a tariff guarantee or an extension um, approved. And that has helped uptake of heat pumps a little bit. 88% um, of commercial RHI applications were have been for biomass boilers and only 7% have been for ground source heat pumps, um, even less for air source heat pumps, surprisingly on the commercial scheme. So it hasn't really had the effect that we thought it would have on heat pumps, but that's not a bad thing. It's It has helped to raise awareness, I think. And towards the end of last year, we also had the Green Homes Grant and the Public Sector Decarbonisation Scheme, both of which were Treasury um, uh, ideas I suppose and they were very much Covid measures 
unfortunately the greenhouse grant has been subject to some very hefty media attack and i don't blame it because it hasn't been very well rolled out i won't say too much on that but i don't think it's been as well handled as it could have been um so those are the couple of um incentives that we have got or are about to lose but this year we are due to have two quite hefty uh, consultations and papers, the heating building strategy and the future building standards, which is due at any time now. These are consultations which will um, uh, determine how we go forward with, with building regulations. And that's how heat pumps suddenly become a stick rather than a carrot. This is what you must do. You must put in, you must not put in gas boilers. You must put in something else, i.e. heat pumps. And next year we have the Green Heat Networks Fund, which should be coming in April 2022. That replaces the Heat Network Infrastructure Programme, which has seen a lot of gas CHP led heat networks going in. This is specifically to help people transfer to a low and zero carbon um, technology network. Um, so uh, that will be funding heat pump, well, largely heat pump um, heat network projects but there will obviously be other low carbon technologies in there as well but the big red or black cloud um, is that last week we had the budget announced and unfortunately there was no specific mention of any of the things that we would have liked to have seen in there so yeah um, money for these things has not been forthcoming this year yet, but obviously the aspiration is still there from government. So we still wait with bated breath to find out what's coming next. But the positive is, you know, people are still going out ahead with heat pump projects, even without the renewable heat incentive, even without having to do it. Even today, I've had a meeting with two separate clients who are looking to just get off gas altogether, natural gas, go over to heat pumps because they know it's the right thing to do. They want to decarbonize. Um, but making the finances work now is absolutely key to getting these projects to work. It's not just a case of, well, put it in because you'll get a grant and you'll get loads of money back from the government. Not the case anymore. So uh, making the finances work and making this stand up on its own two feet is key. So the second um, issue that we're having is um, problem about skills and experience and I think this is actually a general problem across engineering and construction generally. Um, trying to um, um, recruit uh, people who have got the right experience and the right skills and unfortunately because of the lack of policy uh, in, in government to date on renewables there has actually been unfortunately a lack of investment because people don't want to train people up Employers don't want to train people up because what's the point of training people up if there's no jobs for them at the end of it? There's got to be this joined up policy um, piece which says, OK, for the next 40 years, renewables is going to go this way. And therefore, employers, companies, you need to train people up to take advantage of that. And we are starting to see that happen now, but obviously we're at the start of a very long path. And unfortunately, there are a lot of cowboys in the market um, who are giving us all a bad name. And we at the GSHPA are trying very hard to try to make sure that they are heard less and the good people are heard more. And we, along with the Heat Pump Association, are actually designing and delivering our own training courses because we realise that there is a lack of training out there for people who want to get into heat pumps and the GSHPA have put together an education programme. Our, um, um, fortunately our treasurer is actually an ex-teacher and she's written um, teaching packs from key stages one to four, that's from nursery schools up to age 16, for um, uh, teaching about heat pumps and teaching about climate change. So if anybody on here is a teacher and wants to know more about that, please get in touch because that, that is ready to go right now and it's all um, curriculum approved. Uh, I don't quite know the right words, but it's all, it's all there ready to go. And we are also working on um, a new apprenticeship scheme which should launch in September because ground source heat pumps got took out of the apprenticeships a couple of years ago, don't know why. And also upskilling people who want to move up, up from gas, being gas fitters and become heat pump installers. A big thing, big problem is the myths. And I hear this all the time, even yesterday or the day before I was on the phone to somebody 
but one of the MPs who is a complete heat pump advocate, even he was saying these myths, perpetuating these myths. Heat pumps only work in new buildings. Heat pumps only work with underfloor heating. They cost too much. But I didn't get the payback I wanted, mainly because they cost too much to run. My building is cold because it's not heating up properly. I don't have enough hot water. It goes on and on. Unfortunately, these myths are out there and we are trying very hard as an industry to bust these myths because they're simply not true. Um, heat pumps do not only work in new buildings. We have rafts of experience of people with heat pumps in, in stately homes that date back, you know, 500 years where heat pumps are working really well and churches and houses that date back to the Victorian age and terrace houses. Um, you don't need to do huge fabric upgrades. It's great if you do because generally you're losing less heat so it's costing you less to run. Um, but you definitely don't need to rip up all your floors and put underfloor heating in. So uh, it's all about busting these myths. So if you hear these myths, anybody on here, if you hear these myths, please ignore them and actually come and talk to people who really know what we're talking about and we can put your mind at rest. It is um, gas and electric price in the UK, something we call the fiscal background. Uh, you can see here two charts of electricity prices and gas prices. On the left hand side is electricity prices across Europe. You can see UK at the bottom. We are one of the most expensive, second most expensive country in Europe for electricity prices. And on the right hand side, for gas prices, you can see us there at the top which means we are one of the cheapest people in Europe for gas, which means that if you've got a gas boiler, your bill, bills are fairly cheap. And if you have an electric heating system, your bills are very high. As an example there, if you had an annual heat demand in your house, 25,000 kilowatt hours, and you're paying gas at 3p a kilowatt hour, which is what I'm paying at the moment, or your electricity is 15p a kilowatt hour, which I think mine is in the daytime, or just over, actually I think I'm paying 16 pence. You can see the difference in your annual cost of heat if you just took a like for like comparison. Gas boiler operating at 90% efficiency, you'd be paying £833 a year for your gas bill to heat your house. If you switch to a heat pump working at 350% efficiency and did nothing else, your cost of heat would go up to over £1,000 a year. That's OK if you can afford it and you just want to do it because you want to do the right thing. But if you're in fuel poverty or even if you just, you know, this a normal person, you want to be looking at saving money on your bills, not increasing your, your bills. So that also is a blocker. And um, I'm going to talk in a minute just about uh, carbon taxes and, and, and things like that and how that we're starting to hear people talking about how the fiscal background is going to be switched, because if we're going to go down electrification of heat, we need to see electricity prices and gas prices switch over, which is a big deal, but it, it has to happen if, if the government really wants to go down this route. So our last slide is just talking about what's next. Um, sort of setting the scene where we are now, what are the things that are holding us back, but actually people still want heat pumps. So in a way, it's not really holding us back. One of the big things is uh, the decarbonisation of the grid, uh, national grid. So back in 2014, this uh, graph here from Bayes, uh, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. In 2014, the carbon intensity of our national grid was up at 500 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour electric produced. And between sort of around 2017, that dropped very sharply to around 200 grams of CO2. And where we are now is probably about 150 as on, on uh, you know, sort of average. There is an online grid uh, tool checker which updates itself about every 30 seconds and you can find out instantaneously what the carbon intensity of the grid is and obviously when we have a lot of wind power or we have a lot of solar PV you can actually see that grid intensity coming down to less than 10 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour which is amazing. I checked it today and it's actually about 270 grams so not great today because we're in winter and it was quite a dull day. Um, but gradually over time, you can see how by 2034, we're going to be at below 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. So again, that drives us down the route of if we want to decarbonise, if we're serious about this, we need to electrify our heating systems. And therefore, this, this issue about gas and electric prices has got to be addressed. Carbon taxes. 
there was something in the paper on the news um, back in February. Boris had uh, mooted the idea of a carbon tax, not just on gas, but on all sorts of things, fish and dairy, I think. Uh, and then the very next day it was pulled because I think in Parliament there had been discussions and it wasn't going to happen. But obviously it is starting to be talked about. So uh, when you look at your electricity bill, there's an awful lot of levies and additional costs that go onto your electricity price. But on the gas side, that isn't the case. So are we going to see that switch over? I don't know, but it's a possible route forward for, for um, levelling up uh, this, this um, differential between gas and electric prices. Clean air is massive. Um, do we want to go back to burning things and having our air polluted? Asthma and respiratory conditions are exacerbated by poor air quality and in cities there is quite a lot of research that has been done and is being done about the effect of uh, combustion on people's health because it's so concentrated in cities. Um, so by not combusting in cities, you're actually cleaning up the air, which is going to help people's health massively. A couple of things about um, innovative ways of using heat pumps, which I mentioned at the beginning. I uh, can't go into it in too much detail here because of time, but the thing around using heat pumps when electricity is cheap, a bit like in the old days when you use storage heaters, nighttime electricity versus daytime electricity, things have moved on a bit since then. We're now looking at half hourly tariffs for heat pumps and actually electric vehicles as well. So when there is a lot of strain on the grid um, because uh, there's no wind or a, a gas turbine somewhere has gone down, heat pumps can be told to switch off to relieve a lot of pressure on the national grid. And when there's a surplus of electricity on the grid, because there's a lot of sun and a lot of wind, heat pump can be told to switch on. And as a result of that, your tariffs can actually change and fluctuate during the, during the day. Um, at the moment, if you use your electricity between 4 and 7 p.m., you're going to be paying the most electricity prices, the highest prices. The use of thermal storage enables that to happen because the heat pump can switch on, fill up its big tank of water and then switch off again and the building, whatever the building is, can then drain the thermal store rather than asking the heat pump to switch on. And there's actually revenue streams to be had if you've got a large enough heat pump um, from providing effectively demand side response, enabling your heat pump to switch off and freeing up the national grid for other things. Again, that comes down to this peak shaving. So you can actually get away with a much smaller heat pump with thermal storage. And it's saving you cost because you're not using your heat pump at the most expensive times of day. That means you might actually, I think if, if you're a domestic customer and you're looking at something like the Octopus Agile Tariff, uh, which is available now, you could actually be looking at around 5p a kilowatt hour for your electricity at certain times of the day, which is massive saving on the 15p a kilowatt hour. And if you've got a heat pump working at 3.5, 3.5 CAP or 3 350% efficiency, you could be looking at, I'm just going to that out actually, your heat price could be as low as one and a half, less than one and a half pence for heat generation. So that's even knocks the socks off gas. So that is the sort of things that we're looking at when it comes to making things work financially and making heat pumps stand on their own two feet. So that's uh, quite a lot of my talking. Um, I've run over a little bit of five minutes. But I'd be really happy to take any questions. My uh, email address is there if anybody does have questions that they didn't quite get answered. And also with the GSHPA website is there as well. So I hope that's been OK. I'm going to hand back over to Rick. Thank you Thank very you much. Very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we, uh, if we were in the Queen's building still or in the uh, in the uh, um, Hugh Aston building at GMU, I know there will be a big round of applause now, so I'm afraid you'll just have to imagine it, <laughs> but thank you. What we're going to do now is uh, I will read out questions from the Q&A and Laura will answer them and um, we'll try and get through them all um, and so we'll, we'll see how we go. So the first question that we have is from Z and she says, or he says, what are your thoughts on heat pumps now being widely deployed in new electric vehicles?
sorry, sorry we'll just, just, uh, to unmute. Okay. just being uh, just unmuted um so sorry the the question was um being deployed alongside electric vehicles no heat pumps within new electric vehicles i think uh, z oh. means uh, for cabin. so you wouldn't install a heat pump in in an electric vehicle um because obviously the, the heat pump is there for heating your home or your business, whereas electric vehicle is obviously just your car outside. So um, can he, oh, sorry, can she give us a bit more information on the question? Sorry. I think I, I know a little bit about, about this one, Laura. Um, some of the, I know some of the modern electric vehicles, I think the latest Teslas have a heat pump instead of taking, uh, just using electric heating. Um, so I assume they're more efficient in the same way that it would be okay. uh, in the house. Um, right, okay. OK, yes. So in that case, yeah, you're right. I think because if you're if you're looking at a direct electric heater in your car, 100 percent efficiency, if you're looking at a heat pump, you're going to get more than 100 percent efficiency. So you're going to get more out of it for less in. So, yeah, this sounds like a good idea. I don't know enough about them, to be honest, as you just found out. Um, but anything that has got greater than 100 percent efficiency is a good thing. Thank you. Question now from Scott, Scott Borders. I've heard of high temperature heat pumps that can take waste hot water about 70 degrees C and discharge at around 120 degrees C. Do they exist in practice? <laughs> that would be great. I mean, steam, a heat pump that can deliver steam or a heat pump that can deliver greater than 100 degrees, um, well, yeah, high temperature hot water would be great. Um, I have never come across one. That doesn't mean that they don't exist. Um, I have heard of some, well, somebody actually told me about a mine water project where they were taking mine water at 30 degrees C and using it to create steam, which was then driving a turbine to produce electricity. And I was very interested and it turned out that was a hoax. Um, so I don't know about that. Uh, the highest temperatures that we've come across is ammonia heat pumps that will do 90 degrees C uh, using, um, well, whatever source, seawater or, or rivers. Most of the time when you're looking at putting high temperature heat into a heat pump, that's very much driven by the refrigerant that's being used. You're usually looking at about 40 degrees C maximum temperature before you start to see the, um, the refrigerant changing and, and, and able to um, operate on that. So the answer is I have never heard of that. Uh, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but it's certainly not something that's come across my radar in work or in the association. Thank you. A uh, question from Tanya. You will probably cover this, but how deep does a borehole for ground source need to be? And can existing boreholes from site investigations, for example, be reused for this? OK, yeah, good question. Um, so typically a borehole is anywhere between 150 to 200 metres. Typically, it's very much dependent on geology. Um, so I work a lot with uh, specialist hydrogeologists who will investigate the ground and we'll then say, OK, what's the heat demand of the building? Uh, is there any heat rejection? Therefore, how deep do you need to go in your borehole and how many boreholes do you need? But typically 150 to 200 metres is average. Um, can you re can you reuse a borehole? I believe so. Yes, because if you're doing a thermal response test, which means that a borehole is drilled in order to work out how much heat you can get out of it, that can then be reused in um, a bigger array later on. Um, something else that's quite interesting is the use of freshwater boreholes, uh, where somebody's drilled to extract fresh water for use on a site. Um, that can potentially be used to generate some heat. If you put a heat exchanger and extract a bit of heat out of it, you may not get an awful lot of heat out of it, um, depending on the flow rate, but you can use a freshwater borehole, extract some of the heat out of it, and then the rest of the water goes off to the, the, the tenant or whoever's using the water. So the answer is yes, in most cases. Thank you. Um, Harry Sidnell asks, how would you decide if a low grade heat source was viable? Um, OK, so that all comes down then to the coefficient of performance of the heat pump. Um, obviously, in air, you can go a lot lower than 0 degrees C, pulling air in. Um, and when we do a borehole system, we're putting glycol into the borehole so that we can extract water at less than 0 degrees C. So you can go down to, you know, in some cases, minus 10 degrees C coming out of the ground. So that's very low grade heat, but it's still usable. The impact is on the efficiency of the heat pump, because what you're trying to do is to maximise the use of 
free energy so that you're minimizing the compressor. So if I just actually flick to, um, can you still see my slides? See them at the bottom. Okay, so very quickly. So if you can just see the little picture that I presented of the heat pump, you can see the compressor at the top there. The greater the energy within the heat source on the left hand side, the less energy you have to put into your compressor. So let's take an air source heat pump. Um, let's say it's naught degrees C outside. Uh, actually, let's take it because it's been quite cold recently. In Derby, it was about nine, minus seven degrees one night. Uh, that's very low grade energy. The heat pump will still operate, uh, but you will need to be injecting an awful lot more electricity into that heat pump to make the temperature that you need inside your house. So for that particular night, your COP or efficiency will be low. So you can still continue to use that, uh, but your running costs of your heat pump will be high. So over the course of a year, in reality, an air source heat pump air is continually fluctuating in temperature. During the spring and autumn months, you'll find that your COP is higher because your uh, air temperature is higher. Uh, but in the winter, it will be lower because the air temperature is lower. So if you're talking ice, not. But if you're talking sort of low grade, as in minus seven degrees C air, and actually if you think about Scandinavia where heat pumps are used an awful lot, they could be looking at minus 15 degrees C and they still work fine. But you do have to think about it and be aware of the efficiency of the unit. Thank you. Um, Fred Starr asks, what is the COP like at part load? Uh, it dep totally depends on the make of heat pump. So some heat pumps will actually lose quite a bit of efficiency uh, when you're operating at peak load. But the thing is with peak load, you've also got the impact of low temperature into the building and the, the, the free energy, you know, what temperature you're drawing in from the ground or what, what temperature you're drawing in from the air. So you've got three things at play here. You've got temperature in, temperature out, and how many kilowatts and what percentage of load your heat pump is working at. So it's a difficult thing to say. When you look at the manufacturer's data sheet, it's actually given a specific um, brine temperature and water temperature. So it might be brine zero, which means it's coming in from the ground at zero degrees and it's leaving the heat pump at 45 degrees C into your building. And then they'll give you the part load efficiencies at those particular design conditions. In reality, it's changing all the time. So and again, I go back, you know, the, some manufacturers, if you've got an inverter driven heat pump, COP is not affected as much as if you've got a fixed speed heat pump, um, which can, which works less efficiently when it's working in part loads. So it's something to consider. There's a lot more inverter driven heat pumps on the market now. Um, so I do tend to go towards the inverter driven now because there's so much more efficiency at part load. I hope that answers the question. It's quite a long winded answer. That, that, that's good, thank you. Um, Kevin says, do you often find that homeowners have to upgrade their electricity supply to three phase? You can go up to 28 kilowatts now with a domestic heat pump on single phase. So if you've got a very, very big house that needs more than 28 kilowatts, you will need to upgrade three phase. If you've got um, single phase and you need anywhere up to 8, 28 kilowatts, this is a particular inverter driven heat pump, by the way, um, usually 22 kilowatts on single phase, then you will not need to upgrade. Something just worth pointing out now, though, is that uh, Western Power Distribution are now putting three phase into new build properties as standard because they understand that EVs and heat pumps are going to become more prevalent. So if you're built, buying a new house in the future and you happen to be with Western Power, then you'll probably have three phase in your house anyway. And I think a lot of the other DNOs are now interested and, and could be following suit. But the answer to the question is that if you've got up to 28 kilowatts, you can stick with single phase electricity. Thanks. That's of interest to me, actually, Laura. We're moving into a new build later this year, and I think okay. Western Distribution will be our DNO. So uh, oh, I'll make sure I ask that question. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> uh, Mike Langan asks, uh, what is the impact on EPC if you go from oil fired heating to ground source heat pump? I don't know the precise uh, letters, but it will definitely improve it. Um, there's obviously a lot of different things involved with EPCs like fabric improvements. So I think if you're doing fabric improvements and putting in a heat pump, it well, it's, it's only going to go up. How much it goes up, I don't know, because it depends as well where you're starting from. So uh, it might be a couple of steps up 
uh, but it might be an awful lot more if you're doing other things like fabric improvements. Um, yeah, um, I, because I work mainly on commercial and industrial, I don't get involved a lot in EPCs, but what I do know, because I were about to have an EPN air source in, I think we moved, we've got a 1970s house and we've moved up two places on the EPC. Thanks. Ian asks, what is preventing new housing developers with brownfield sites installing ground source networks? That's a good question. That is a very good question. And I would like to sit down with every developer in the UK and ask them that very question. Um, cost, uh, they, they perceive it as being um, a high cost, a high risk. Um, there's, it comes back as well to uh, what people are used to doing and the skills that we have in the UK. So if you're a house builder, and I know this because my husband's actually a house builder and has worked for some of the big developers, if you've got a group of plumbers who are used to putting in gas boilers and then you come along and say, oh, but now we want to put in um, a low temperature heat network and we want to put heat pumps in, they'll be horrified. They will, put, they will instantly see that as a huge risk and a huge cost. And that has to be passed on to the consumer, which means they may not sell houses. It's enough that they're putting solar PV panels on the roof. I mean, that's like groundbreaking. Um, so I, I would love to see that happening. And it has a really good financial case. It, if we start to look at um, ground loops as infrastructure, so instead of putting in a gas network, which happens on a, heat, on a, on a new building site, if you were to put in a heat network instead of a, um, a gas network, that's exactly the same thing. But I think it's a lack of knowledge. It's a concern to people. They see it as, as um, hitting their bottom line. And until the government force them to do it and planning law forces them, unfortunately, a lot of the developers will continue down the path of gas boilers and if not gas boilers then individual air source, which is a real opportunity missed because a ground source ambient loop or even a ground source uh, fourth generation network lends itself to so many other things than just having individual air source. But it's a great question and I would love in a year to have the same conversation and say things have changed, things have moved on. Thanks. Mel and Steve um, ask, uh, we have a three bedroom 1930s house with double and, uh, and triple glazing and external wall insulation and a gas boiler on its last legs. Uh, you mentioned not simply replacing gas boilers with heat pumps. Can you advise if we should keep both? And what other measures would we need to do to ensure that we have sufficient heat on the coldest days? Uh, for your information, we do not have the garden space for ground source. OK, OK, that's fine. Um, we're just having an air source heat pump fitted. As I say, we've got a 1970s house, a slightly newer. Um, the key thing would be looking at the emitters, so your radiators. Uh, when you put in a heat pump, you want it to operate at low temperature. Uh, you want it to operate at maybe 50 degrees C. So the radiators that you have in your house may not be sized correctly for 50 degrees C flow. And the heat, the radiators will no longer feel burning hot, which in my opinion is, is a good thing anyway, because you don't want to scald yourself. But they won't be able, or they may not be able to emit enough heat into your rooms to make the rooms feel warm. These days a lot of radiators are actually oversized anyway but what you'd need is an installer who knows what they're talking about to come in and assess the whole building. This is the, the, the key to retrofit, it's assessing the whole building. So looking at the radiators in each room, are they big enough, are they suitably sized for a new reduced flow temperature from a heat pump? If they are, then leave them be. If they're not, then it's time to probably take out a radiator and replace it with a larger or a double panel or a triple panel, depending on the size that you've got. Um, what else was I going to say? Um, you can keep your gas boiler as a backup if you want to. And if you've got room, <clears throat> we consider doing that. But I want to put my hot water cylinder where my gas boiler is. Bear in mind, you will need a hot water cylinder. Um, I don't know if you've got a combi boiler, but you will need to find space for a hot water cylinder. You can't have a heat pump without that. Um, I think actually those are the key things really. Um, trying to keep your flow temperature down, replacing your emitters. And actually the other thing to, to do, two things, we've, we've actually turned our gas boiler down to 50 degrees C to find out what happens in the house. So if that's something you can do, I recommend doing that now, although we are starting to come to spring, so you wouldn't see the enough of a change, I think, to work out whether that's working for you. But that's that's an opportunity. So anyone else listening, you might be thinking the same thing. Turn your gas boiler temperature down to 50 degrees C, see how it feels in the house. The other thing is don't 
run your heat pump the same way as you run your gas boiler. So don't have the heat pump coming on at six o'clock in the morning and switching off at eight and switching on again at five and switching off at nine, that sort of thing. Let the heat pump run uh, and keep you a nice background of heat all the time. So it stops the building cooling down, heating up, cooling down. The heat pump doesn't have to work so hard to keep the temperature up uh, at, a, at a comfortable level. So it's about thinking about different ways of operating your heat pump away from gas boiler. It's not a gas boiler, but make sure that you get a good installer. Thanks. Um, Fred Starr, still on radiators actually, Fred asks, my impression is that in older houses, the real benefit from radiators is radiation, requiring that the radiators run at a fairly high temperature, about 50 degrees. What is the COP at this temperature? So if you're actually if your heat pump is running at 50 degrees C, that's perfect. Um, so the COP of a heat pump, say running at, well, it depends again on the, on the source temperature. Let's say you've got a heat pump that's got a brine of, so a borehole temperature incoming of five degrees C and you're trying to generate 50 degrees C, you might be looking at a COP of around 3.9 or four even. Um, obviously your borehole temperature is going to fluctuate. And if you have an air source heat pump, where you're trying to deliver 50 degrees C in the winter and it's not degrees outside, your COP might be down at three or less. Um, but at the moment, you know, I'm running my gas boiler generally at 75 degrees C. My radiators are really hot. Um, I have upgraded some of them and running now at 50 degrees C, they're absolutely fine. So it does come down to surface area, radiating because it's, it's all about surface area and what the wattage that the room needs. Um, so yeah, you can get COP, very good COPs at a flow temperature of 50, but um, try not to go above that unless you've got a high temperature heat pump or a specific need to go higher. Great, thanks. You're doing really well here, Laura. You're going to be exhausted. <laughs> by the end of all this. Uh, got plenty more, so with your permission, we'll, we'll press on. Uh, Bruce says, uh, we have a gas fired warm air heating system at home. Is it possible to keep the warm air distribution, but have a heat pump providing the heat? It would appear to offer less of a temperature rise, so possibly greater efficiency. Yep, yeah, um, you can buy air to air heat pumps. They have been around actually a long time. They have fallen out of favour because when the government decided to do the renewable heat incentive, air to air heat pumps were excluded. So for the last 10 years, you won't have found a lot of people having air to air heat pumps. Um, if you haven't got to upgrade your internal heating system, then it might be OK for you not to claim renewable heat incentive. So, uh, yes, you can buy air to air heat pumps and you wouldn't be able to claim RHI, but it might be financially better for you to do that rather than having to put a new wet system into your house, which would cost quite a lot of money. OK, Jason says, have we had any more clarity on the public sector decarbonisation fund? Will there be future funding rounds? Yeah, OK. So one of the recent publications from government, and there's been that many, I've lost track, but one of them, it might have been the white paper, uh, did hint that there is going to be two, one or two more tranches of PSDS funding. Um, we hoped by now that we might have heard about the next tranche, but we haven't yet. So. The, the intent is yes, there will be more rounds of funding. When it will happen and if that's definite, we don't know. We're still waiting to hear from government. Thanks. Fred uh, again says, is it advisable to incorporate a large heat store in the heat pump system? Yes. <laughs> yes, there is a limit. Um, so if you had a eight kilowatt heat pump and put 50,000 litres on it, that might be a problem. But if you can put a big thermal store on it will benefit you in so many ways because even if you ran your heat if, if you're on economy seven electricity let's say run your heat pump from midnight to 7 a.m fill up your thermal store and then let the thermal store heat your house for the rest of the day if you can so there's so obviously it comes down to the maths then of how, how what's the peak load of your house and how big do you need your thermal store to be but that means that you might only be spending 10 pence a kilowatt hour on electricity to run your heat pump for that many hours during the night and then it never operates du during the day so yes absolutely big thermal stores definitely thanks catherine warren says i live off grid in wales my oil boiler needs replacing 
I have land, but it's hard to justify the cost of a ground source heat pump as the annual savings will be very small according to various websites. EPC is D. Am mm -hmm. I missing something? Um, again, it comes down to uh, whether you've taken domestic RHI into account because you've still got until the end of March 2022 to apply for that and that will pay you uh, quarterly for seven years based on your EPC demand. Hopefully that's been taken into account. You need to look at your electricity bill uh, and your tariff, what tariff you're on if you switch over. I'm not I'm not selling Octopus, by the way, I'm not being paid by Octopus Energy, but they are the ones offering a brilliant heat pump tariff at the moment. Uh, have a look at that and see whether coming onto a lower electricity tariff or a different tariff could benefit you. That's the key thing. So you're not missing anything. Ground source heat pump is very expensive. There's no two ways around it because of the ground works mainly. Um, but if you look at the um, RHI and your tariff, that might help with the running cost, if not the upfront. There is also the Green Homes Grant, which will pay up to £5,000 of something like a ground source heat pump. Um, and we're just waiting to find out how much budget there is left of that because it's been slashed because of the disastrous nature of its rollout. But that's the things to look at. Thanks. This next one isn't actually a question. It's um, a bit of information for everybody. Um, at uh, 6.30, Anonymous tells us for information at this exact moment, the grid is 241 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Thank okay. you. Yes, that's worse than it was today. <laughs> Sun's <laughs> gone in now. <laughs> uh, Tim says, Tim Rook says, how do you view the increasingly vocal hydrogen lobby on the use of hydrogen for heating? And could the noise they are making be a distraction for regulators and building owners? Yeah, I mean, there is a place for everyone in this whole mix of heating for the future. So we are very much uh, saying that electrification of heat is the way. We think it's the best way. But there's definitely room for uh, hydrogen. There is room for biomass. There's room for direct electric, even though it's expensive. So I'm not going to say that the hydrogen lobby are wrong. However, hydrogen, we're being told by Bayes, is seven to eight years away before it's widely available. We don't know how much hydrogen is going to cost. Of course, there's a big noise from the hydrogen lobby because they can see the fact that you know gas has been around for yonks and they potentially could be losing quite a big share of the market, which means loss of revenue, loss of money. So they want to make a, a big noise. They're very well funded, um, whereas the heat pump people are sort of like me with volunteers and we just love heat pumps. So uh, we, we come and talk to people, but they are well funded. Um, but yeah, I think there is a space for them, but people have got to be aware that it's not a silver bullet. It's not 100 percent hydrogen. We will still be burning natural gas because it will be a blend of the two. Um, so I think, you know, heat pumps are here now. The government have said in every time you listen to them, they mention heat pumps, heat pumps, heat pumps. So um, I think heat pumps could well take a good share of the market uh, and should and should do because we want clean air and you're still burning hydrogen, which still releases particulates. Thanks. Andy says, I have a 20 year old house. The EPC is C with uh, its original non condensing boiler. When the boiler gives up, should I install a heat pump? Question mark. Well, I think I know the answer to that. Uh, it seems like a leap of faith compared to a new condensing boiler, which is the default option. Yes. If a heat pump, air or or if a heat pump, air or ground source? Question mark. Plenty yes. of garden space. I've got additional insulation and four kilowatts of solar panels. Excellent. Well, that sounds like brilliant. Yes. Um, ground source more efficient, more expensive to install. Air source cheaper to install, more expensive to run. Um, if you get it in before the end of March next year, you will be able to get your renewable heat incentive and that's, you get more for ground source because it's more expensive to install. Uh, Greenhouse grant again, five, up to £5,000 grant uh, available uh, for either ground or air source. Um, if you're looking at ground source, make sure you talk to the right people because you just want to make sure that you're garden is big enough. People are sometimes surprised by how much land they actually need. So I think the first thing I'd recommend doing is getting somebody to have a look at how much heat you could get out of your garden, because if there's not enough ground, that might actually mean that by default you have to go and have a look at an air source because you haven't got enough ground for a ground source. Thanks. Abdul asks, how much would a heat pump cost to install and would the price of running it go up as more people switch over to it? 
or switch over to heat pumps due to an increase in demand for electricity? Mm. So, yeah, I mean, it totally depends on the size of heat pump. I mean, if you're looking at a sort of um, an eight kilowatt air source heat pump, you might be looking at around eight or nine thousand pounds. So it is more expensive than a boiler, hence why we have the RHI. Um, will prices go up? I hope not. They can't go up any more than they are already. If we want to go down the electrification route, we have to bring electricity prices down. And Octopus, as I say, is the only one at the moment doing a, a flexible tariff specifically for electric vehicles and heat pumps. And we can only, well, I can only assume that the other uh, electricity providers will follow suit. So as we start to see the national grid being managed differently, I mean, we talked to the Energy Networks Association who uh, work on electric vehicles and heat pumps because they realise this is coming. Um, there will be more flexible tariffs because people, the national grid operators will want people to use electricity at um, times when there is more solar and, and wind on the grid and less when there's a lot of stress on the grid so therefore there's got to be financial reward for that so i think we're going to see those tariffs come more and more so um prices should come down and i would be surprised if they go up but if they go up it will be because you're on the wrong tariff thank you um, well, it's actually seven o'clock now and we have quite a lot more questions to go. Um, so uh, I think I might ask uh, one more uh, question from the list here and then uh, we'll save the other questions and email them through to you if that's OK. And if you if you wouldn't mind um, uh, emailing the responses. Uh, Laura did put her email address on the last slide, so we'll perhaps show that as well, just so that anyone who didn't note it down can do that. Uh, but the last question then goes to Scott Borders, who says, I have a heat pump as an option on my ID3 when it arrives. Ah, this is back to cars. Okay. Um, um, Scott is going to buy a Volkswagen ID3 and the heat pump is an option. It's not actually a question. So, sorry, I'm not going to, that's just a statement. I'll go to an actual <laughs> question. Oh, <laughs> Mike Langan says, you mentioned the compressor. There are companies developing advanced compressors such as Lantra and Phi2. These have higher pressure ratios, e.g. up to 7.5. How will this impact on heat pump performance? Um, well, I can only imagine that the performance will improve, but it might be more to do with refrigerant. So I'm not sure what refrigerants they're developing them to work alongside. Um, I mean, if they're working, if they if they were working in conjunction with things like the propane or HFOs, uh, which are the other low global warming potential refrigerants that are capable of going high temperature. Um, then that sounds like a great thing. And I think actually compressor technology, if you look at the other things that make up a heat pump, um, a con two heat exchangers and the expansion valve, the only way you can improve efficiency of a heat pump is through compressors. So if they are uh, working on next generation compressors, that is because they want to improve the efficiency of not only heat pumps because compressors are used everywhere, but it will only improve the efficiency. So again, we're seeing people investing in the technology to make heat pumps more efficient which says, you know, heat pumps are the way to go. OK, thank you. Um, I'm afraid, folks, that that's all we have time for. Um, so thank you very much to Laura. That was absolutely brilliant. And thank you for your stamina in answering all of those questions. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> that, that was great. Um, I think we uh, we can just show the last the last slide again. Um, And if you've enjoyed tonight's uh, session, then um, please look out for uh, future emails and communications from the East Midlands, uh, East Midlands Energy Institute, uh, because we've got more talks in this series coming up later in the year. Here's the slide. Can you see that? Is that okay?